about creativity in entrepreneurship, entrepreneurship education at schools. Now, I'm delighted that we've got nearly 70 people joining us from many countries across Europe. Um, I've seen lots of mentions of Croatia, Romania, Turkey. So welcome from those countries. Uh, if you're from other countries, say hi, Italy. Brilliant. Um, now, if I can just go to my next slide. I wanted to introduce today um, to really look at a little bit of, of perhaps insights into creativity in education. Before we move to speak to us, speak to Dr. Andrew Penaluna, um, who will be joining us to share his work, his experience, both at policy level, but also very practical understanding of creativity in education. Um, so why do we need to focus on creativity in education? Um, we need to do this because really this is something that is an issue for learning right now. The US um, has been at the forefront of some interesting research that's come out, came out first in 2011 and was then redone in 2017. Fantastic researcher called Kyung Hee Kim wrote a book called The Creativity Crisis. And she found through looking at a longitudinal study of creativity testing that there had been a significant decline in creative thinking. Um, in recent years. And she found that while this, the level of creativity had been steady until around about 1990s, since then there had been a significant decline. And she was able to attribute that decline to perhaps the overfocus on standardization testing in education. Some of the things that we hear from many educators across Europe is a real issue for them in order to um, and she found that she redid this study in 2017 and found that in the US, this hadn't got better. Indeed, it had got worse. You can see that graph there where the drop in um, creativity outbox thinking skills, really looking at the original thinking, that fluid thinking, the ability to create and generate ideas, solutions had been had dropped again in the 10 years from 2011, 20, 2011 to 2016, six years, in fact. How does this map to Europe? Her research caused a tidal wave of reaction in the US because the US is traditionally a country of creativity, innovative thinkers, entrepreneurial thinkers. In Europe, I took a look at the recent well, 2016 Eurydice study on entrepreneurship education at school in Europe and looked at the frequency um, of where creativity as a skill was explicit within the education system. And you can see here the challenge that we found back in 2016 that it's sometimes stated as a general aim, but it's rare to find that those specific learning outcomes related to creativity um, within entrepreneurship education. So it's interesting that you see these, this, the top line is for um, lower secondary and the bottom scale is for upper secondary and the little letters, they relate to each member state or partner country of the European Union. So you can see if the, the darker the color, the more prevalent creativity can be seen. The red means it's found in compulsory education. The, the medium color means it's found in cross-curricular themes and the light color means it's found in optional subjects. So this here, you can see that the prevalence back in 2016 was not high for creativity and entrepreneurship education. So we weren't bringing it out enough. That's not to say, and I speak from experience of really working with a huge number of teachers across Europe and having the pleasure to work with some huge number of teachers, many of whom have fantastic practice in this area. So it's not to say that teachers aren't doing, but it's not present in the education system. So as a precursor to this webinar, we asked you, as a teacher, do your students get to develop and value their creativity? Many of you said yes, either fully or partially. You can see the green is fully, the blue is partially. The next two lines, formative and summative assessment. You can see there that there is a lot of teachers out there who are using formative assessment, assessment as learning, for learning, to support learning, to help learners really deepen their understanding of their skills, their knowledge. Formative assessment, they're using that to, to recognize the creative competences of students and to 
surprisingly as well for me looking at this they're using a lot a lot of you are using summative assessment to recognize those creative competences where we see the difference here is again at the teacher level it's generally um, higher levels of uh, creativity higher numbers of teachers are saying they do develop creativity through their students than those teachers saying my school highlights creativity is important for our students there's quite a lot but significantly less there and when we look again at the level of the education system well we find that teachers you guys um, who have responded to these uh, this survey feel that it's it is in some countries um, highlighted at the level of the education system but not in all and really when we look at it it's only just above 65 percent that are either fully or partially and so that's nearly a whopping 35% of teachers feel that in their education system, creativity is, is not really highlighted uh, within, within the education system. And that's, that's something that is an issue, especially when you, know, when you look at the sort of the policy drivers, the, the enthusiasm, the recognition that creativity as a competence for a young person is important. You can see here the percentages. Um, 66% of you feel that it is highlighted at the level of education system, over 33% not. Um, just to do a shout out to people who are putting their, their saying hello in the chat box down there, we've got lots more countries coming through. I can see hi from Portugal, Albania, Spain, Italy, so it's great to see you. Welcome. Thank you for joining us. Um, so the reason that this, this thrust for creativity and the importance of creativity of a competence for young people has been highlighted both across the key competencies at European level, but also particularly within the entrepreneurship competence. And this is where you look at entrepreneurship as a concept, as, and we see here the Entrecomp model. The Entrecomp model is the basis of the entre entrepreneurship competence. It's the European model of entrepreneurship, and it really focuses on a broad understanding of the knowledge, skills, behaviours, attitudes that young people can benefit from um, through their lives to be more entrepreneurial in their society, in their community, um, to support their local their local cultural heritage, or to create businesses. And really, when you look at this, entrepreneurship is when you act on opportunities and ideas, transform them into value for others, financial, cultural, or social value. That, that idea into action process, entrepreneurial idea into um, action process, has creativity as it, at its core. And that's why I'm delighted to welcome Dr. Andrew Panaluna, He's the Professor Emeritus of Creative Entrepreneurship from the University of Wales, Trinity St. David um, in Wales, UK. And he's really got, I believe, a solid grounding in how we look at, how we understand creativity through education. And he's worked extensively with Welsh Government, who are looking at significant curriculum reforms right now. Um, and... He's also worked on a number of European projects at European level. He was inter integral to the development of uh, the Entrecomp framework. And I'm delighted to see that Margarita Machigalupo is also in the chat room there. And she is the architect of the Entrecomp framework. Um, so I'm absolutely so pleased to, to welcome Andy. Andy, if you want to turn your camera on, then the participants will be able to see both of us. And he's going to, to talk us through his work, his experience, and his understanding of how perhaps we can introduce this into education. And then we will move on to look at some practical tools and ideas that you may be able to use too. So, so welcome, Andy. Thanks so much for joining us. If you want to just turn on your volume, you need to activate your microphone on the top. It's a little drop down menu next to the microphone sign. A tiny technology issue here. One second. I hope that's working. Is that clear? Can you not hear me? We still can't hear you, Andy. So, is this one working by any chance? 
No? <laughs> Great. Um... If you go down to select microphone, you should have built-in microphone there. And yes. if you click on that, that should be... And you cannot hear me? All right, we've checked this earlier and it did work, so... Um... Ah! Okay, everyone else can hear Andy. I can't hear Andy. That's interesting. <laughs> but everybody can hear me. Okay, we're good. Okay, all good. I've now activated my speaker. Do you know, sometimes the technological issues are all your own fault. <laughs> Apologies for that, Andy. I'm really sorry. Okay, so tiny blip. I'm going to turn my microphone on a little bit. Andy, I hand over to you. And um, yes, if we can swap the presentations over now, that would be wonderful. Hello, everybody. Um, if you, you've got a little noise on my side, I'm just going to turn down my microphone a little bit. hear me, but can you still hear me? Everybody okay? Multiple attendees are typing, so uh, not that good. So I'm going to turn it up just a little bit more and uh, just see if there's a problem, please tell me if we're talking and I'll adjust the microphone. Is this making a noise? Is that okay? There's an echo. There's a little bit of noise behind your microphone. It was better just before, oh, uh, actually, I think. Adjusted. Um, the noise, noise is gone now, I hope. Not so much. We can still hear a fair bit. Keep talking, and then I'll tell you when it keeps it's it's moving. So we need to move your move on to your um, PowerPoint as well. I put a light on. I'm wondering if it's causing any, any interference. Bear with me. You won't better see me so well, but it's not better. Is the noise gone? It has. We haven't got your your PowerPoint up yet. Um, let me just message the hosts and just let them know. One second. Okay. While you're doing that, I'll um, speak. And if somebody has any problems, let me know. I'll, I will do my best to. Um, not turn to you. We can hear. We can hear. Gellan. <laughs> yeah. Okay, is I'd say I've, my headset is broken, I'm afraid, so I'm using the microphone on the computer. Okay, so um, okay, I think that that, that it is, but you probably need to come closer to the microphone because it's yeah, just so a little I'm bit too to my quiet. Computer, so I've uh, moved my computer. So hopefully that's better. That's. <laughs> That's much better. Okay, maybe you can introduce yourself and your work while we're just getting your PowerPoint yeah, sure. up. Um, I was, was mentioned earlier on, uh, Professor of Creative Entrepreneurship, but the story behind that really is that um, I didn't even call myself an entrepreneur, even though I had businesses and things like this. Um, uh, I had an international business, had offices in Florence, for example. But my wife, who was my bank manager, told me I was an entrepreneur. So I guess I learned to be an entrepreneur because of my wife and because of the bank. But one thing we really learned from each other is that uh, she was very good at the money. She was very good at understanding how to make a business work once it started. But she was less confident in uh, understanding how to get a business going, how to engage people, how to find opportunities. So that side of things uh, became my uh, side of the world, as it were. So we work very much together. You're hearing from me, but it's very much something that we're working together. So are we able to have the slides? Okay. 
We're just getting there. One second. Thank delay. You. Um, here we go. <laughs> right, so this was a, an illustration we did as part of some training in Northern Macedonia where we've been working with teachers. And so we've used some pictures and things from that. And creativity and entrepreneurial education, uh, a lot of it is about learning and sharing, which we're doing today. So welcome from Mumbles in Wales, which is very nice and quiet and calm today. Uh, how many different animals can you see in the clouds? You know, how many different shapes and forms can you see in the clouds? Because children love that. And uh, this is why I took the photograph today. Of course, you're going to do exactly as I say, aren't you? Because actually, what's wrong with that message? If you don't know what's wrong with that message, well, do exactly as I say. If a teacher tells you to do something exactly to, as they say, you can copy the teacher, you can imitate the teacher. That doesn't mean to say you can cope when something changes. So, yes, we'll be looking at uh, using Entrepreneur to help us, of course. And today, the sort of areas we're looking at will be around this top end of the Entrepreneur wheel, with a particular focus on the creativity, a particular focus on the spotting opportunities, so you will find vision in there as well. And thrown in the middle of all of that is actually how do we cope with ambiguity, uncertainty and risk? Because our children uh, will be having to deal with these things and trying to see how they can cope when things change. So when you look into the Entrecomp framework, there's lots of messages in there to help you. I'm not going to go through them all, but you can see I've shown the ones up to advance there. Where you can actively search, and this is the sort of thing we want. We want people to be able to search and be able to spot. So, if you look at the top of the text, it says develop several ideas. And that's key. We're not going to be talking about developing an idea. We're talking about developing many ideas to achieve these valuable effects, reflecting many effects. In this one. If you also skip to the spotting opportunities one, you'll see analytical approaches, proactively looking for there's a lot of common ground here. Identifying and seizing opportunities, uh, bringing together scattered elements. And that's what I'm going to be talking about a lot today as well. So, if we just do some mathematics for a moment. It's quite interesting when you just ask that question. And also, there is innovation without the creative thought to kick it off. So, everything winds back to having creative thought. There's this issue we're talking about now as well, constant change and things never being the same. So, when adaptive people look on this, they draw on their ideas, they connect and reconnect in various ways to find new potential solutions. And set it all very one, usually in the menu. So the triggers for thinking here I put in, uh, we get a lot of discussion about necessity entrepreneurs. People who have to become entrepreneurs because they have no choice. So they tend to copy other people, they tend to be um, motivated by the money and simply surviving, which is perfectly understandable. They rarely have an effect on the economic development according to the research. So, opportunity entrepreneurs. So these are the ones who spot ideas, these are the ones who act. They're on the alert. Now, this alertness is important. So um, they have a positive impact, we know, but it comes back to this alertness. How do we develop that? How do we help them? So this is a piece of work we did back for the OECD that I often draw upon. Because we have to start by opening people's minds. So very often what we have is maybe someone having one or two ideas and it's considered by the teacher to be enough and then we start to say okay let's test those ideas and we rush to the right side where we're trying to actually evaluate and test ideas before actually perhaps we've got enough material or enough ideas to test properly. So in that situation we have a term in the UK called premature articulation which means you're coming up with an answer before you really look at the potential solution. Of course, if something changes, as we know is in real life, 
when something changes, we have to start opening our minds again. So whilst I've drawn two sets of triangles here, uh, this actually can carry on and on at the pulse. And our teaching can map, mirror that and map that. Well, so what's happening with creativity? Well, Evan's already given us some insights. And, um, you know, a young child who might play with building blocks and you might write stories and might make experiments with uh, the science. And then you get to maybe school or certainly university where all of a sudden there's the right answers and you're a little bit worried about getting the right answer all the time. This can actually deter creativity because you're not taking any chances and viewing things from other perspectives. So let's think about that. Hmm. Many of us will be artists. Many of us will be designers. What is the difference? Do we ever discuss this? Uh, the picture we used at the beginning is actually very much the artist. But uh, what is happening here? Well, the artist is very much sort of thinking about what do I or another artist think? I'm interested in other artists. An interest in being an artist. The designer, their creativity is used slightly differently. So they start to think about what do my customers think? What do people around me think? How can I use my creativity to help other people? So the two areas, they're not grey, black, sorry, it is grey, not black and white. People tend to move between these two areas. So if we just sort of think about that, all these sort of timings and what you're doing can actually make a huge difference. So just by way of example, the artist may have an exhibition and all of a sudden they've got to think like a designer. Because if they're a designer, they've got to think about the people visiting the exhibition. Who will come? Why will they come? Whereas if you're the designer, sometimes you see the same things happening and you want to be different. You want to just have fun and experiment because it feels good to be creative. This is something else we know from the research, that the feeling good to be creative is actually really helpful. Yes, well, I put this slide up because changing the way that we assess and we map performance is really, really the issue here, because you can't assess something and test something that is new that you don't know about. I went quiet. What did you do? <laughs> I was talking to some colleagues from Europe today, from Spain and Italy. They're, they're staying with us um, in Swansea, in Wales at the moment. And everybody, when they come to the UK, they look the wrong way when they cross the road. So this is inspired by that. Some things we do, we don't even know that we're set in our ways, that we're doing things that's just, you know, because we've always done it that way, we don't tend to think of it. So that's a point to make here. Sometimes we try and disrupt, we try and make something a little bit different so that it's opportunities to actually see beyond what we take for granted. And yes, it is important to be happy. In fact, in creativity, they say that your emotional uh, response to things is actually more important than your mental response because you're thinking about all kinds of things and you're relaxed. You're not afraid that you're going to get it wrong. So let's look at this in reality. Here's a potential project. What's happening in this picture? Well, we can see a man, we can see a sail. Doesn't look very awake, does it? Oh, this one. Well, maybe he's a little tired too. I wonder why. Oh, here's another one. Now, those of us who are male, may actually recognise this. Maybe it's to do with shopping. Now let's just stop and think. By observing those things and making those notes, in this case my students, they can come up with all kinds of ideas for what, how do we help these people? What do we do in the shops? Do we provide chairs? Do we provide a special type of chair? So there's all kinds of creative opportunities of spotting things that maybe are obvious that we take for granted. So the opportunities come often because we see things that 
we've seen before many a time, but we'll see them in new ways. So in this case, there's a business opportunity here to see uh, perhaps what these people can be doing. Of course, when we're exploring and observing, actually spotting things that are the same. You know, what patterns are there? A uh, little bit like asking a riddle. When you uh, have a riddle, you try and find out what the answer is and you use your traditional thinking. And you don't get very far. It's when you get home and you say, oh yes, you remember. But sometimes every day we see similarities, but we let them pass. We don't really stop and think. So when we see Stefan's work here, for example, where he's actually been, he's just stopping in galleries and taking photos of people looking at pictures, you can already see what their preferences are and the sort of things that they might like. So the question here is in the classroom, what have you seen that maybe other people should miss? So it doesn't necessarily have to be an example here, of course, it can be anything at all. So quite often you can throw something into a question simply saying, was, okay, what has everybody seen? Has anybody seen anything that maybe other people have not seen? Seeing things differently is so important. Now, okay, this is a little bit of fun here, but this is a youngster and an older person, and quite often, I mean, I've had my students going around with um, sticks tied to their legs so they can't walk properly, so they feel more like an older person. Now they can experience what it's like, not just talk about it, they can experience. So this kind of seeing things differently could be an age thing. It could be a cultural thing. Maybe someone from one country helping another country. Just seeing things differently. So we do our best to ask questions that say, okay, what is the normal? But what could it be? And just have fun and just see what happens. Because everybody sees things differently. While you're looking at this slide, you will notice your eyes flipping from one side to the other. And you're looking at the face as if it's looking at you, and then it will flip so that it's looking from the other side. Now our brain is designed to do this. Our brain is designed to see things in different ways, and to spot something quickly, because that's fight or flight, we need to understand our environment quickly. But it's also designed to see things differently. So when you look at the two faces, thank you, you'll see it's actually two faces drawn into one. However, our idea is not just to see things differently, maybe if you have two faces, maybe more faces. Maybe if you ask your pupil, can you see three different people? And do you see a whole face, not just a half a face, or many faces? And what happens when you look at a picture like this? What, what is it that you notice? After a moment or two, Ask yourself the question, who is going to remember this event? Our technologies have moved on so much that a quick photograph is often meant to be the memory. And the memory will be lost in the computer or lost on the telephone, maybe showed this at the front and then forgotten. The lady in front is the only one in that crowd with that mobile phone. I would suggest to you that she is the one who is going to be remembering and will see what's happening and be able to discuss it to a greater degree, even though he's got no photographs. When you start to look at things differently, you start to actually see many ways of seeing things. This is what we're trying to help our young people to see. We have many perspectives, many views. So the fact that money is the root of all evil comes from a folded American bank loan. And so this is what creative people do. They link and they connect things that may normally just be there in front of you, but you don't see them differently. So you've got nothing new to link and connect. You can help young people by getting this connectivity there. Now I don't think Cassandra's with us at the moment. She's hoping to join us. Um, but Cassandra's in Australia at the moment. And she keeps putting pictures up of things that she spotted. So this is a very simple exercise we found. What do you spot that's different? How can you see things differently? So Cass, in this particular example, 
I've simply seen uh, road marking and recorded it as the number four. So she could quite easily um, have done all the numbers and the things that she observed. So this is an observation exercise, just to see things with Do I need to say anything now? Maybe another age range. If you've never seen a floppy disk, why is that symbol that shape? So we need to mix things up. We say here the world is full of dots, and uh, I've got a TED talk on this you're welcome to have a look at. But the world is full of dots. What we need to do is to disentangle and see the detail and spot the dot. What are these different things out there? Because when we've noticed these different things, we can start to connect them. And so young people are really, really good at this. Uh, this morning, as Ellen and colleagues will know, I've been with a group of European colleagues who have been taught about creativity and enterprise. The teachers, I won't say their ages, but the so the teachers who were the pupils, because they came to listen to what was happening here, were being taught by three eight-year-old pupils. So we've done this before, we've done it in Croatia by the way, where once the pupils have actually had the uh, learning, they then teach some of the other teachers. And that's fascinating because they tell you things that you haven't done. Well, my daughter loved this picture. So you can look at that and you can see all the expressions and all the faces in the cakes as well as in the dogs. Because you make associations. This is called by association. My Michael Christ has written a lot on it. Where you connect the unconnectable. You make links between things where there shouldn't really be links. And again, this is what we're trying to do. Yes, uh, Philip just went there, um, no more than creating the dots. But a good point, I think, from Steve Jobs' uh, speech was that he joined them backwards. He didn't know what those dots were going to be. When he started out and he was sleeping on the floor of a friend's room, picking up coke bottles, going to classes about typography and lettering, then going to classes about computing, he created all of these dots. And he didn't know how he was going to use them. And I guess that's the message, that you fill your head with lots of dots, and then they come into play later. Maybe like this. Somebody somewhere just simply spotted that. And I think that's a great picture, because already we're, we're making assumptions visually. And it's because the person has spotted that opportunity in a brief moment, and I'm guessing they can say so. Uh, in the mirror. So my wife's going to be in sunny Italy soon, so yeah. maybe you can inspire them just by asking questions that wouldn't normally be asked. Of course, there has been snow next to the park, however, we say, but not normally. So, what would it be like if we went to Turkey and we had snow? What would it be like if we went to Morocco and we had snow? That sort of thing to us is. <laughs> Being asked about materials at the moment. Most of the materials I've got here are simply things I've taken uh, which are copyright free on the internet. Um, so I've made these up myself. You see what I mean by the questions? Good teachers don't tell the pupils what the answers are. Good teachers can actually set scenes, set scenarios where the uh, car can actually, in this case, at the Rolls Royce. This is a real project. And some of my students actually work with Rolls Royce and Aston Martin. So I know the way that they work. And this is what they do. They throw in questions that are unexpected. So trying to put in questions together is really helpful. And just inventing things and inventing questions by that. And then you let the learners come up with the answers because you won't expect them. So these are just a few sort of teasers, as it were, and tips. So this guitar, you can actually go online and it's fully playable, it's a bass guitar. Um, but they couldn't afford a guitar and they just decided to make one from a garden spade. 
Now, I've, I've traveled the world and, you know, when I go to some countries where perhaps the resources aren't there, you see some amazing things where people take uh, unused objects and, and reuse them, repurpose them. So that's another thing you can do. Take something and make it do something else. This is something that caught my eye just recently. I'll tell you, it's just gone from the web. So, uh, all it is is going to the car scrapyard, buying the pieces, uh, which is very, very cheap, using that creative talent to create value that is nothing before. So, the sort of model, this one you can see the BMW badge and the VW badge, are just made of the car components that have been repurposed and remodeled. So what are these abilities uh, demonstrate what they get to do about? So of course the question is how do you actually ensure that people get the opportunities to think of them? Once we've got the thinking, we can then start to think about, okay, is there value in this idea? Is there unexpected value in this idea? So in the case on the left, you can see the ceramics, someone just having a little bit of a, a swim in your teacup um, with the shoes and things like that is worth a lot more money uh, and people will buy that because it's fun, because it's interesting. The one on the right is actually one of my students, we just had Halloween and uh, what she did was she uh, decided to create these sort of petite things that uh, are just marshmallows and uh, strawberry jam and half biscuits. So it's that sort of making something up and saying, yes, people would like that. So this is where you actually have to think about beyond what you want, what maybe your people I guess what I'm saying here in all of these pictures is if you do one shop and you get it wrong, you're not being very imaginative. And thank you there, so you get the uh, imagination. If you're imaginative, you can come up with many, many ways of doing it, many alternatives. If you don't try these lots of alternatives, you're not going to be able to uh, come up with more than one or two ideas. You need to encourage these links and connections by joining the dots, especially if they could be joined that other people don't see them. So in that way, as teachers, we've got to stop thinking like pens. A pen usually gives one answer, it's written very carefully, as neatly as you can, and you're terrified about crossing it off. Don't take a pencil. Pencils can sketch, they can draw heavier, stronger, they can help you imagine things and see where the mistakes are and see where the correct things are. You can erase what you do, it's less pressure. You can of course revisit, modify, and just spot patterns. So this particular set here is something that's popular on the internet. So I noticed many a time before on my own pencil pencil. Why am I talking about all this in such sincerity? Uh, we're not here today to talk about um, the cognitive neurology behind creative thinking. There's two main ways that the brain works I'd like to draw to your attention. Uh, the first one is what we call synaptic efficiency. And this is a bit like the cross on the road we were talking about. We do things quickly, we think quickly, we don't even stop to think that we could do something different. And we could do it in a different way. Synaptic plasticity is when the brain reconnects. Imagine being in a room with a lot of electrical connections, and you always use the same plug, and you connect it to something else, and you always do it. Imagine being in a room full of plugs, where you can change things, move things around easier. That's synaptic plasticity. Instead of using the same brain circuitry over and over and over again, and reinforcing what you know, you sometimes have to Unlearning. Unlearning is when there's a new connection in the brain, something new that you as a learner have not experienced. It doesn't matter if the teacher's experienced it, it matters that it's new in the mind of the pupil. So it might be something you knew already, but you don't go say, oh yes, that's been done before. You encourage the pupil to explain why they've seen that as new connection. And that's what synaptic plasticity means. Most of you will have woken up or be driving the car one day and you go, oh, I need to do this. Maybe just buy milk. And that's a new idea in your head. 
And unless you write it down or keep telling yourself, you forget. It, it just goes over your head. Creativity is like that. So you'll see people, like myself today actually, just approach me. Creative people then always carry something around with them to make a note. So you can encourage young people to keep a notebook, to record what they see, what they see, why they think it's important to them. And then you're starting to develop this synaptic plasticity. This is a way of teaching that really encourages you not to tell our people too much, but to try and tease them into answers that they can discover. Now we know that the word gap is often sort of discussed as conversational exposure. So in, when we look at brain functionality and we look at those that are of a sort of harmonies when the creative idea comes to your head, talking about them, sharing them, communicating with them, trying to work out why did I think that? Why would I say that? Why stim why what stimulated me thinking that way? Actually pressing this ability to look back into your own mind, to reflect and be able to understand what's happening is really, really valuable. So in this particular instance, what we try and do is we try and make sure the teacher, as much as possible, avoids giving the answers, but maybe suggests exploration that could lead to the answer. We've had this before about the emotion, someone's mentioned that earlier. And some of you may be familiar with uh, Dave's own group of thinking, which is all based on how curious you are. If it doesn't interest you at all and teachers not got your attention, it's not going to happen. If you've made the pupils very nervous and anxious, it isn't going to happen. Uh, we all know when we're very stressed that we don't tend to think that creatively. And the example I often use, uh, perhaps unfairly, is my wife and I, when we argue, we often get stressed with each other. And uh, the next day we we'll laugh, uh, maybe sit down with a glass of wine that night and say, why did you say that? Because the emotion has such an impact on the way that we think. So trying to develop this excitement to make it relevant, interesting, and the exploration and the discovery in the mind of the people is what really important to you. Okay, the, um, Margarita just asked me about the teeth as an example of creativity. Anything can be used to foster anything confidence is meaning in a negative way. Okay, um, yes you can be negative, but if you're looking at the outcome, we also need to think about the ethical dimension. So in the case of the um, who it's for, how you might use it, Ethics are so important. Creative people can be quite damaging as well. So that's part of the decision making process. In the triangle I showed at the beginning, I wouldn't stop people having those ideas and still ask them to explore a lot more ideas. But when it came to the closing down, the blue triangle, uh, that's when I asked to say, well, did that hurt somebody? Did you want that done to you? And something like that so that we can understand the human side. Okay, the big, big issue that always comes up with these kinds of things. Uh, this is some work we did with the OECD and the EU back in 2015. We worked about 27 countries and 27 schools there, and we're trying to work out where the barriers were. And what came up was a lot of them are uh, down to how do you evaluate? How do you know you're looking at the pages of this? So we came up with this concept of innovation versus implementation. And the example shown in this particular illustration is can the student write a business plan if directed by the teacher? In other words, there's a right plan. And we need that. Please don't dis uh, disregard that. We need that. Now, theory is an experience, but maybe it's not been tested. So quite often we teach through theory, especially in higher education. But it's really when it becomes real that it matters if the theory is useful. Let's spin that around to innovation. Let's ask the students to respond in a friendly, happy, positive way to short-term and ever-changing environments. So instead of setting a project and saying, this is your project for six months, you say, this is the first part of it. The second part will be given to you too. And then as it builds, you can build in change. So as the project develops, you can actually 
bring in things that are relevant, that are interesting, it might just help them to see things from multiple perspectives. So new ideas are very much linking up to this connecting new talk about people. Just to actually sort of put some work behind that over there. Uh, rewarding the two eyes, we need to reward those. Our implementations would probably follow the rules. The example I often give is that actually if uh, I have someone working on the electric in my house, I want them to know the rules. I want them to know the colour of those wires. And that's important. I have clear goals. It's a lot of debate about whether coal goals are really useful in terms of jumping. Because a goal can lead you to the premature articulation, can lead you to find a solution because it matches the goal really easily. Creative, creative people. So I'll just turn that up a bit. Hi, Andy. Yeah. Hi, Andy. It was, it, the, 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 the sound has got a little bit worse, so I'm just wondering where we can rejig it again just to, to improve it because okay. there's lots of positive feedback coming through, but just, just now it's just got a little bit worse. Okay. How about that? Is that better? That is better. So I'd say just keep close and keep talking to the microphone because sometimes we lose words as okay, well. I'm sorry. Uh, I'll try and say, tell me if I'm uh, not here, if you can hear me. Thank you for that. Uh, no. so what I've got there is that if we're doing implementation, this clear goals I was just talking about can sometimes be a hindrance, but an implementation is really important. We talk about value creation, for example, and Mark and our colleague talked about that. That's often about creating value that you can see, that you know, you have a goal for it. So maybe there's a way that the teacher knows is the best way of doing things. And we can do it as a told or expected. Typically, we have single correct answers. Just like in an examination or test, we know what the answer is. However, let's look at the innovation for a moment. What we talked about already, really, New ways of seeing things, seeing new ways of seeing things. Instead of a goal, try and link and connect things together in new ways. Don't even try and find a goal. Experiment, have fun, see what happens when you connect and link. Create surprises. Have you ever thought of this? That if something is creative or innovative, you haven't thought about it before and your people haven't thought about it. The more creative, the more innovative, the more surprising it is. So therefore, the goals and the working towards known knowns can actually work against this process of creating surprises. And as I mentioned before, one of the big keys to this is having many alternative solutions. They may not work. They won't work sometimes. And then you can use that second part of the process of actually deciding which you'll use, where are the limitations, where are the ethics needed. And that's what creative people do. They hold back from uh, making those decisions until they feel they've got lots and lots and lots of alternatives. And they're not just working to one, two or three. And that, I think, is one of the biggest keys that I can share with you. So why is this so important? Ellen's already touched on it quite a lot, but um, I've just given some examples, and you can find these on the internet everywhere yourself. Uh, how about that? One quarter of Dubai's buildings will be 3D printed. What does that mean for anybody who wants to grow up and um, maybe work in architecture or buildings? What would a building look like if it can be 3D printed? What materials will you need? Uh, the thing about soft skill there is. Just talking about, I think it was Margarita and some others who uh, mentioned this as well. The one they talked about is criticality. And again, maybe we need to be cautious with criticality. Because if you're critical, as was explained on a recent uh, program here in the UK in school, it's easy to criticise other people. It's very, very easy to tell people what they want. Need a person also surprised, ah, but you could do this, you could do that. So if we look at the critical side, the red triangle I showed you at the front being the opening the mind and closing the minds, if we look at them in isolation, we can help to develop those curiosities, we can help to develop the creativity. So the human resource management, 37% of 
companies and businesses are looking for problem solving, critical thinking. 32, this ambiguity, complexity. And I think the one that says communication is going to increase. But go back to what I was saying just now, just now. That if something is going to be new, innovative, creative, it's going to be surprising. You need very, very good communication skills to actually explain why that's valuable. The statistics came from uh, the Society for Human Management, and it's on the page. If you type in this soft skill, that type of thing will come up uh, with the World Economic Forum. So I guess this is my closing slide in a way. When uh, young people I work with do go, uh, the young people today, the eight-year-olds, are going to a sock factory today. And when they talk to people in the uh, companies and the businesses that they talk to when they're in school, that they visit when they're in school, quite often this sort of thing comes up. How well prepared are you for this ever-changing environment where creative thinking is going to be so important compared to know the exact right answer. So I'll leave you on that note and uh, happy to take any questions and to see what thoughts you might have. Ellen? Hello, thank you very much. I was just thinking about your last slide. If we can, if we can just, I mean, creativity and entrepreneurialism, it does equal um, success. But I just looking at this slide, and it really is something that, that is quite close to home when you sort of think of young people going into the world. And so many, so often, um, what they feel is that, you know, they're raring to go, but sometimes what employers are looking for is something a bit different, and sometimes that can be difficult. Um, so, yeah, I was chuckling at that slide, to be honest. So, thank you very much, Andy. Um, that was really interesting, and I think a lot of different things have been brought up. Now, is my audio okay when you when you listen to me, just to, to put into the... Um, my microphone is still on and I can hear you. <coughs> okay, great. Maybe when I'm speaking you can turn your microphone off and vice versa just so we don't get any interference. Just that little perfect, thank you. Okay, so uh, first of all, we've gone through, we've taken a journey through creativity, understanding, you know, how students maybe can see things differently looking at space, time, resources in a different way, allowing students the, the space to explore their own creativity, to really look around them, to, to be able to link, to connect. And then that, that opportunity of assessing um, creativity in a different way, to explore how to um, join things up, how to create surprises for your students looking at alternative solutions. And that's something that really comes through that third, one of the first slides you showed, which was the convergent and the divergent thinking, looking at lots of ideas and then converging on one idea. And one thing that you can put in between that, which I've seen you do before, Andy, is that that opportunity to, to put in different, different situations that students have to deal with in order to build another, that aspect of creativity, which is adaptability and flexibility. And I think so there's some really interesting ideas and concepts come out there. Has anyone got any questions um, that, for Andy? We've had one thing come through, which is how can we share these, get these resources? They will be uploaded onto the School Education Gateway website. Um, as so the presentation will be uploaded and also the recording. Philip Bergelman uh, says, when I ask students to think like a pencil, they freeze. They feel very uncomfortable. They think I am crazy. It's a thing they've never done. Uh, and how, how can I help them to take this threshold? So, Philip, just to clarify, is you know what you're saying there. You've you've done something very quirky, very interesting with your students. They've reacted in a very interesting way. Do you want them to sort of like move through that? What's what? Do you have a specific question on the end of that? Ooh. 
We've got lots of people typing. Any more questions coming through, that would be great. But amazing, you've asked them to be a pencil. Now, uh, this is a very interesting question coming through from Tanya. And this is something that we looked at in, in one of my first slides. Schools are very stuck on exams. Teachers have programs to follow. The curriculum is busy, isn't it? It's busy and sometimes it's prescribed. You know, you don't have so much space to be creative yourselves as teachers. Will there be time in schools for creativity? Andy, maybe you want to touch on your work with Wales on this. Um, you can hear me again, yeah. I've got Philip's uh, question there as well. Uh, we, here in Wales, we've taken a massive leap, and we've now got, if you want to check on the internet, maybe this can be a resource, Ellen, uh, successful futures. We've got a curriculum coming in in 2022 that is already running now. It's based on four purposes. And the four purposes uh, include one that is having enterprising, creative contributors to society. So in other words, what our teachers will be tested on is whether they can develop that, not whether they can answer exams. But there's an interesting twist here, because I think it was, is it 2015, the road to success, Alan, that there was uh, a report by the European Commission that looked at people who can talk this way, who taught to be creative, and one of the things was they actually did better at tests. They actually were able to, um, and thank you for sharing it, they were able to think around problems, think around issues. And they became, they were much happier in themselves, their mental health improved. And there were all these things that came out from the search where people had a chance to be creative. One of my uh, roles is I helped to set up a research group uh, for the creative industries. And if you interview the creative industries, which in the UK is one of the biggest growing industries we have, uh, you've only got to look at our music or to look at the movie industry. Um, what you've got there is so many people being creative and innovative because they like to be creative and innovative. It's almost like the money is incidental. So in terms of health and well-being, giving people a chance to be creative seems to be very rewarding indeed. So that's my way of thinking. Uh, taking the whole creative enterprising uh, contributors so seriously and in about three weeks time you're going to hear about or you're able to hear about the new curriculum and dare I say that Entrecomp has had a huge impact on the way that we've been working on that. Uh, my role has been looking at the competencies so we'll take that forward for you. Uh, somebody saying they, they can't understand me um, if you look at the connection that Ellen has just sent to you, you'll find uh, the four purposes of the new curriculum. So our entire country school system is changing to actually take account of these uh, entrepreneurial approaches. To come back to Philips, yes Philip, this is a common uh, issue. How do you bring people out into a way that they unfreeze? The best way I found is to create learning environments where the right answer is difficult to find. I quite often use the example of something called set square. And again, feel free to look that up. Set square, researcher to innovator. It's a program that we run for um, PhD students and postdoctoral students whose knowledge is phenomenal. So they are, we joke that they've got brains the size of planets. Um, but if I put them into a room with coloured paper and ask them to find the correct route across the room using the coloured paper, uh, they struggle. They're trying to find the theory behind it. They're trying to um, trying to sort of work out how not to look silly. And they typically take. Uh, I, I have to share this example with you, maybe in more detail. But they typically take an hour, hour and twenty minutes or even an hour and a half. And these are some of the most hot brains we've got in the UK uh, university sector. I did it to primary school children from grain school here in Mumbles. How long do you think they take to do the same challenge? 
Do you think they're as terrified as making mistakes? All I do at the end of it is I show the uh, research students pupils age seven and eight achieving the same task in seven and eight. I think the longest is 11 minutes compared to their hour and a half. And then they start to get curious as to why uh, their creativity isn't there. And you can ask them what they've forgotten that they used to know. That's one example. I hope that helps. Thank you, Andy. We're getting a little bit of feedback again on your voice. Um, but I think that I think everybody's getting you. And I've posted the links up both to Set Squared um, and also to um, to the Welsh curriculum, which is a very interesting model. It should be added here that there's some interesting developments also in many countries in Europe. Belgium, um, Flanders has just introduced a new curriculum as well, um, where Entrecom has been integrated into that curriculum, and creativity is very much um, being focused on through that across all subjects as a cross-curricular competence, but made more explicit, perhaps. Sometimes cross-curricular competences can disappear. And I think what we, what we see with the research and the insight that Andy has shared is that these competences, creativity, needs to be explicit, needs to be known, understood, recognized within the learning process by, by both teachers and by students. So they see that they are developing, they are really improving their own creative thinking abilities. And that it's not something that is innate, that they're born with, but it's something that they can expand and enhance through practice, through learning, through experiences that trigger emotions, that trigger learning. Um, I would wonder if you have, um, if anyone has any questions. Some people are thinking that Zoe has, um, Zoe Galou has said, some people are thinking that alternative seating in class can distract students' attention. What is your point of view? Andy, do you want to answer that? Or I can also um, offer a point of view here. My microphone's come back on, Ellen, if you want to mute yours in the left. Hello, can everybody hear me? Yep. Um, interesting enough, this came up last year with a group of teachers I was working with. And we decided to let the pupils arrange the room according to the tasks that they were given. So instead of having a set seating arrangement, this classroom has got um, tables with wheels now chairs with wheels, and each time the uh, pupil group are given a task, or set into groups to do tasks, they move the room around to seat them. So they have created the learning environment themselves, and this goes as far as what's on the walls. There's a series of things that the people themselves bring in that they think are relevant. So what is on the wall isn't necessarily what the teacher thinks should be there, it's what the pupils think can be there when they're dealing with a purpose, when there's something to be doing that is actually um, primed up getting some particular aspect done. So if you take creativity and you say, how many different ways can you describe an animal, you'll get a great list appearing on the wall. And that's the sort of environment that uh, we find, is the physical environment follows the need of the class. It might not be easy for some of you to understand, but it's certainly something that seems to work when we've done that here and there. Thanks for that. I'm going to post um, a link to a very interesting um, kind of architect of learning spaces, which which I think could be interesting also within this. Um, and it really shows how the learning space can impact um, on learning, what is learned, how it's learned, how students interact, um, and the, the competences that can be enhanced through that. Now, I'd like to say, what I'd like to do now is say thank you to Andy. Um, and for the first, the next few minutes um, of the webinar, just to finalize, I'd like to share some, some interesting sites and resources that, that you might find um, useful to take a look at um, and to, to, to sort of look into for your own teaching, for your own classrooms. Um, but thank you very much, Andy, to, for your input and your um, insights into this. It's great to have such, such a, an interesting way, a really creative way of looking at it and forcing us to think differently um, about how we see things 
and it opening us up to really how how we can do that with our students. I include that within myself for my in, in myself as well. Now, I wanted to to share with you just as a final part of this webinar a few different projects and initiatives that are happening um, around the world that maybe you might have heard of, you might not have, but could offer you um, resources that you can use. So this is some practical resources that link to creativity. Now, the first one I want to share, it's called Femtech, and it's from, uh, it's developed by the um, autonomous community of in, in the city of Barcelona uh, in in Spain, and it's really an interesting um, set of resources. You can see on the left-hand side, they come videos, music, movement, topics, experiences, activities, and this is, creativity is at the heart of all of them. It's all about putting non-formal education methods and resources into formal education. Um, and it's looking to encourage young people to see creativity taking the initiative as interesting and key to their lives. Um, so that's one resource. You can see the link here um, below. We will share this presentation online so you'll be able to access these. They're in Catalan. There is some of them in English, but go via Google Chrome and it will all be translated um, automatically for you. And it works quite well. Believe me, my Catalan is not very good, so I've tested this. Um, but what's interesting here is it's not often you see creativity resources that look both at art, at activity, um, outdoors, but also at how your brain supports creativity and thinking about that. So this very much looks at some of the aspects that Andy was talking about, um, that synaptic um, plasticity and really explores that. Now, the next project I'd like to look at is a classic, if you like. D School is the Institute of Design at Stanford University in the US. Um, it's all, D School is all about creativity. It's kind of the home of design thinking as a process. And here is a link to their K-12 lab network, where they have a number of different resources in English this time. Um, that can help K-12, so school teachers, to develop. And they've got a lovely, really short, sharp design thinking methodologies that you can pick up and take um, into your curriculum. So highly recommended as a place where you can go and have a look at things. Um, I'm introducing these briefly. As I say, these these um, links will are on the, the um, slide and they will be then uploaded onto the website. This is We Are Play Lab, which I have to say has the best website name ever, WAP.rocks. Love it. Um, and this has a number of different um, projects that they run. It's based in Switzerland, but they work across Europe. And each of these projects, um, there's four projects, Project Square, um, it's all about digital and creativity, building entrepreneurial competencies, but very much based within the digital world. So take a look at this and you can go around the website and see the resources that are available across these different four projects. Um, Project Square has a number of different curriculum resources and then the others have um, are examples of activities that are ongoing. So this is a very interesting um, opportunity to take a look. The next one is, again, looking at something different. If you're a language teacher, then Cradle is a European project that is developing activity-designed learning, um, very much entrepreneurial competence-based, inspired by EntreComp, and has, again, creativity at the core of this project. Um, and they're doing that for language learning. So teaching curiosity, creativity, a sense of initiative through um, an entrepreneurial learning experience that focuses on both the competences but also the development of languages. And then the last one I'd like to mention is, is really a number of different activities that are supporting EntreComp. They bring together the resources around EntreComp and perhaps the people as well that are working around EntreComp. Um, and at the moment, there is a resource center in development for EntreComp and entrepreneurial learning where, where they will bring together a number of different um, resources. But what's already there 
um, across the internet, you can see there is a wiki with a number of different practices. Often they're searchable by competence, so you can search for the creativity competence there. And that's simply entrepreneurial.education. The next one, entrecompedu.eu, is teacher training um, to support teachers on their professional journey and to develop their competences um, in, in entrepreneurial education, to deliver these competences as part of their education, a part of their teaching. Um, and then if you look on Facebook and Twitter for at Entrecomp Engage, you will find communities there that are active, that are sharing, um, that are looking at um, Entrecomp as a resource, as a tool, um, and obviously creativity within is, is such a big area, such an important area of this. So you can really look at that. Um, and there will be um, community hubs upcoming in Spain, Italy, Moldova, Turkey and Belgium in a project that's um, just about to be launched I believe, early next year. So if you link up on Facebook and Twitter, you'll get more information about that if you're from those countries. Um, an opportunity for educators from all levels, schools, vocational and universities, as well as youth work to really engage. Now, that was a quick flick through some of the resources that are out there. Maybe you have more. If you do, please do share them through through the chat and we'll gather the, that information up and share it back too. But that brings us to, to the end of our um, webinar today. We're very grateful for your participation. We've got a huge number of people online, so it's brilliant to see such interest in this theme. Um, and there will be um, a, as I say, these will be linked into the page um, of the School Education Gateway website. So you'll be able to download the presentations and also to access the recording. Um, and all of the links that we've spoken about today are within those presentations. So you can make sure that you won't lose those. Um, but if you want to um, connect to others working on creativity, working on entrepreneurial education, please take a look at um, the School Education Gateway website where you can find resources, but also then at Entrecomp Engage is a useful um, Twitter handle as well and Facebook link. So I would like to say thank you to Asi and Eleanor from uh, European Schoolnet who've been behind the scenes really supporting this website, making sure it works. Um, thank you to both of you. Um, I'd like to add then a big thank you to Andy. I should start my webcam at this point. A big thank you to Andy, um, who has been such a support for this work and for this activity across Europe. Um, and thank you to everybody here to, to really for participating and listening in. Um, I think that what we've got here is a great community of teachers and educators interested in this theme. And if we've got this number of people involved and such commitment and interest in this theme that we saw in the survey that we took at the beginning, um, that you took um, when registering for this webinar, then that's really fantastic. And it's wonderful to see such interest and enthusiasm for this topic. We feel it's important and we're glad um, to see such activity across Europe. Thank you very much to everybody. Um, yes, um, just like also my big thank you for everything. Yes, Asi, do you have anything to add? Um, can I mute yes. you for a second because I hear some echoes? Yes. Um, okay, so yeah, so very a big thank you for both of you. I just wanted to say there were some comments about learning spaces and I'm taking this opportunity to uh, remind everyone that the next deck webinar will be about learning spaces. So it will be a whole uh, hour about that. So join us next week on Thursday the 14th at 5 o'clock, same place, same time. And I just uh, jump ahead here for the last slide about the, um, the feedback survey, which is also Ellen said, thank you for taking these surveys. It's a great community, very active. So if you click there, you should be able to see the survey. And then for the certificate, um, you have a link there if you click. And please um, note that it's uh, valid for 24 hours. So if you want a certificate, you should do it as soon as possible. And make sure that you're logged in with your Teacher Academy account 
on the website otherwise you're not able to get it so it has to be locked in and as mentioned we will share the recording and the slides afterwards on the page so that's a uh, that's all from me from now anything else Ellie? Me, thank you so much. Thank you so much, Assi. That's all from me too. So thanks to everybody again. And yeah, get your certificate there. Take the feedback survey. The feedback survey is very important. We need to know how you found this in order to really be able to improve what happens next. Just a moment, I will post it here as well. Give me a second, I will dispatch it.